up to cool. you. No, yeah, let's. So I, I like. Um, I've been talking a lot about Plato with different people, and um, I like just starting to talk about why we like Plato or Socrates. It's kind of like a more emotional, fun way than just jumping into questions. So if you want to do that for a minute, I'll, I'll start. Um, I've been reading the dialogues with some friends for I don't know months and months and months now, and they're they're all very very smart people and we always learn new things like not just intellectual things but just like about life and people and it's amazing um that that it can do that so i don't know is what is something you like about any of this world of platonic mysticism or plato or well plato um you see something new each time you read the dialogues and uh, letters, you know, so uh, each time there's there's some uh, revelation or some new discovery, and I think Plato uh, provides uh, a, an accessible way of understanding or, or accessing uh, ancient thought in uh, great depth connecting back to the ancient mysteries and you see that in some of the you know some of the dialogues so i think plato there's uh, uh far greater depth than uh is usually uh recognized if he's treated his work is treated as uh just dialogues just discussions there's more to it than that yeah um it's kind of amazing how he both incorporates lots of views in such elegant ways and also like just the words and the vocabulary that he has socrates or other people talk about like you you get introduced to concepts um like we were talking about uh capacity and capability from reading the sophist last week and i'm going Oh, that's such an amazing thought. And it just kind of sneaks in there. It's not even a, a word that comes up 50 times in the dialogue. But when you start to think, like reflect back on it, it became like a really meaningful part of what we were talking about. Um, so that that elegance to be able to just be so wide and so deep at the same time um, is kind of cool. So are you doing a um, series of podcasts? How uh, are you doing introductions? How do you, how do you do the podcast? Yeah, so it's a little free form. I did want to read off just the, the amazing um, list of books, some of the books that you've written so people can know you a little bit because um, everyone I know that knows you loves your work. I've never had someone be critical that's read one of your books um but then people i'm surprised people that are really into plato like i have a friend named eric who has been teaching a course on the dialogues in various forms for about five years and is really into philosophy and has like a music training and uh, is really into it and he had never heard of you so i'll just read some of the books that that um that are on amazon that you've written so my friend a couple of days ago was really interested in the conversation with Apocalyptic Times, the book you came out with last year. Um, and then your second best selling Kindle book is The Secret History of Western Sexual Mysticism from 2008. And then Perennial Philosophy, um, John cites that, John Verveke cites that in his series and praises it. And I love that book too. It's such an um, interesting book. A lot of times, I guess it gets confused with Huxley. And uh, I'm like, no, 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 there's this awesome perennial philosophy book. Um, and then the book that we're gonna talk about today, Platonic Mysticism, uh, Contemplative Science, Philosophy, Literature, and Art. And I actually got a scientist um, to do some uh, hesychastic contemplation. And then we talked about science for like an hour in, in a podcast episode I did, just based on like your last chapter where you're talking about how, oh, this hasn't been done a lot. The idea of contemplation and science is, is uh, not really a part of the mainstream. Let's see some other books that you have that are very popular. Uh, Theosophia, Religion of Light, 
uh, mystical state, pol politics, gnosis, and emergent cultures, uh, magic and mysticism, an introduction to Western esoteric thought, entering the mysteries, um, let's see, American gurus uh, from transcendentalism to new age religion, and so many other books as well. Like you're prolific. It's amazing how prolific you are in popular culture, as well as maintaining a, a, a chair of an academic department. Um, are there books that you love that I didn't just read the title of that you would love people to know about as well, or other really awesome accomplishments of yours that you want to share about? Well, I appreciate that. You know, uh, uh, the you know the kind you know the kind remarks, and as far as uh, Platonic mysticism goes, the the second word there is mysticism, and uh, most people uh, there's a uh, not a very strong um, uh, emphasis on mysticism, let's say, in the academy. And so it's not surprising that uh, philosophy, somebody in philosophy would never have uh, delved into a book like that. There's kind of an allergy that uh, contemporary philosophy has to um, religion in general and mysticism in particular. So, you know, the reason for writing that particular book is in part that it brings out something that in a whole current of thought that just hasn't been discussed. It's not on the radar. And part of the book actually discusses how much that's the case uh, now compared to even 100 years ago. Uh, where there was a general consensus in European-American scholarship, Anglo-European-American scholarship, you could say, um, there was a general consensus about the, you know, the centrality of and the nature of Platonism, which has been mostly eclipsed. And instead of that consensus, you, you mostly have a kind of rationalistic um, focus within philosophy and Plato comes in as a kind of um, addendum now and then but the essential things the the really uh, what's really important is often overlooked and so that's why I wanted to bring that book out yeah it's interesting um, I was reading a book where they brought up Newton and he was really into alchemy and you never hear about that or um, uh, Nietzsche was interested in Emerson. He was, I guess, a huge fan of Emerson. And you really have to dig to hear about these things. Um, why, why is that? Why is there such like almost like an allergic reaction to mysticism among scientifically oriented people? And especially like we're a scientifically oriented culture where if you want to win an argument, you just quote science enough and then people are persuaded by you. Uh, well, there's a, there are, two aspects to that. One is, you know, an emphasis on discursive uh, thought or rationality as the only form of cognition. That's, that's one, one aspect. And then another, another is what you could call physicalism, which is an emphasis on the, on the uh, physical reality alone. And there's no other reality. There's no, there's nothing higher than that. And so, those two are dominant in our contemporary society for the most part. So the kinds of subjects that I'm interested in, which are really about consciousness, uh, most people, uh, broadly speaking, are not um, uh, privy to, they don't encounter discussions of that, although that is changing. Uh, there is a shift happening and you do have some people including in the academic world that really are crossing into the area of the study of consciousness and that that's transformative over time and I discussed that a little bit at, at the end of Platonic mysticism so for example authors here include uh, Imans Barus who's a, a Canadian uh, specialist in uh, psychology and uh, psychology and consciousness um, and there are a few others B Allen Wallace I think his work is quite important and he 
he is uh, focused on the intersection of uh, science and Buddhist study of consciousness specifically. So definitely there are some some people exploring this area and I think there's a lot to be optimistic about actually. Uh, I think things are necessarily changing uh, right now. And the book is a small contribution to that larger uh, opening. Yeah, I, I, I said this to you before when we were talking with John that it's, it's almost like if you could just read one book, you get so much because you, you cover both just some exemplar figures that practice mysticism since Plato, but also you talk about the critics, people like Wallace, and, and give people an opportunity to, to see kind of where it left off since the Enlightenment or where it could go now. Um, and why do you like this? Like what, is there any like, a lot of scientists, because I've studied like creative people and scientists as a scientist, and a lot of them have like these kind of pivotal moments that change their identity, that push them into something. So a physicist will fall in love with physics and then become a great physicist or a mathematician. They have these early experiences, usually before they're 30. And then like, is there anything like that for you or how did you get drawn into devoting so much of your time to this area? Well, I, I uh, explore things that haven't uh, haven't been explored enough and that's you know that's really what I do so I get interested in a subject and go deeper and that uh, that's the very nature of exploration so it's entirely possible to be an explorer of different domains to explorer of uh, domains of knowledge consciousness and so you know I love to do that I'm doing what I love to do and uh, that's that's what I would say about that. It isn't a single transformative experience. It's that with each uh, subject, each area, it's an opportunity, writing is an opportunity to explore that area. And so the transformative transformative experience is in the writing itself. That's the that's the uh, transformative uh, shift that takes place because that's the exploration and a reader is exploring that terrain with me. So that's, you know, that's essentially what these different books do. And perennial philosophy is one of those. Uh, that's that's a, an unusual book because of the tone the there's a intangible quality to the way it was written uh, that harks back to Plato and Plato's dialogues it 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 reaches out to the reader and so that that book in particular is one with a special kind of a special kind of exploration but all of them do that yeah it's it's that's excellent and do you have advice for people that are training to be academics or maybe writers or just want to explore this space so that they could learn from your experiences or um, avoid pitfalls maybe that you see other people have made or younger graduate students you've worked with have made or colleagues even? Well, not really. I, I would just, uh, all I do is pursue things that I feel called to do. And if I don't feel called to do it, then I don't do it. So, you know, that that's my idiosyncratic method in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, being called to do something is, is kind of undervalued a lot of times. The, the um, efficiency culture we live in really rewards people for doing the most productive thing, which like calling in the, in the academic literature is to me the coolest because it really is going to be the most meaningful to someone compared to a something wrote or something purely that serves society for material gains or something like that. So that's cool that you just 
get really interested in something that you think hasn't been explored and then dig in. How long do you spend writing a book? Is there a consistent time or is or some of them just happen in weeks and others are months and years or how does that work? Well, I just finished a book for uh, Oxford University Press and that took, uh, that's the, it's not quite complete. I'm still adding and discovering some things that are, that fit in uh, and need to be, need to be added. But uh, that, you know, in the conception that took several, you know, several years to begin and then about a year to write. Uh, so, I mean, they, these, these books take a while. Uh, some things are a little different. It just depends because that has probably a thousand footnotes, you know, 900, something like that, wow. which is a lot, you know, that and notes, that's a lot of, you know, kind of background support. And it includes things that have never been published in scholarship, published about in scholarship before. It introduces whole new uh, figures, uh, really remarkable people. And so that, you know, that book in particular is, has taken a lot of effort. Um, and at the same time, you know, all books do. It's you just keep at it, you know. You just keep at it. Yeah, that's that's excellent. And I remember I just wanted to ask you this because you said once briefly that you had visited the sites of the Eleusinian mysteries and studied that. What's it like to to interact with old texts or these kind of it's we're in kind of an amazing time for Greek scholarship or ancient scholarship. And do you have any like fun stories or uh, anything like that? Yeah, when you go to the site of the Eleusinian Mysteries now, you're going through a kind of post-industrial uh, warehouse uh, type landscape. Uh, it is pretty remote from what the, the initiate would have experienced many, many, many centuries ago. Uh, but there is a little bit preserved. There are other places that I've been in Greece where it's been much more, uh, the environment is much more well preserved. Uh, but often there are just, there's just rubble. Uh, so, you know, there, there are relatively few places where you can go and feel a, uh, connection to the mysteries as they were. Even Samothrace, which was a great mystery center on an island off the coast of Greece, um, renowned. I mean, it was it was renowned into uh, Roman times as as an initiatic center. It's rubble. I mean, there's there's nothing left, and there are some computer generated uh, images. Uh, 3D images of what it looked like, what, you know, but it looks nothing like that. Uh, what is preserved is just the landscape itself, because it's an island. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, other places like that where some of it has been, has been preserved, but we don't know a lot about the mysteries, really. We know some things. And going to these kinds of sites is really helpful. And that's part of the exploration, you know. Uh, so I've, I've traveled a lot over the years. Now, right now, I'm not traveling very much. Uh, doing, you know, you kind of alternate between uh, travel and writing. But writing and travel together, that doesn't work so good. <laughs> and like, it seems like Athens was such a smaller city and huge chunks of their population participated in these things. So like, what were they and, and what could we be accessing by having something like that in our culture? Or like, yeah, what are the mysteries? Like, it seems so foreign as a modern person. 
Well, the mystery traditions uh, did uh, wane and ultimately uh, they dwindled and ultimately disappeared and the initiates were sworn to secrecy which they you know people largely kept so there are only hints here and there of even what the mysteries were uh, but one can say that they included um, a period of uh, going into the underworld or darkness or um, some kind of fear experience and then uh, illumination and an experience of transcendence, um, joy and a connection that, that carries you to a different posthumous destiny, um, which is blessed. Uh, those things were said to be part of the mysteries in general and uh, to some extent you could say that some of that was carried on in Christianity um, because Christianity can be understood as a mystery religion as well uh, so there there are elements of mystery religion in Christianity uh, most Christians don't think of it that way because they probably never heard of the mysteries to start with. and it, uh, But the word is actually itself preserved in Christian tradition. There are the mysteries in the Christian tradition. There's uh, that term, that word is actually used. So, uh, you know, there are some things that can be said about that, but it's in general not the case that people think of Christianity as a mystery tradition. It's just that one can see it that way. And should should modern people be trying to come up with their own myths or, or ritual initiation processes or like, especially people that are drawn to that? Because there's a lot of people that like, I'll ask this question maybe. A friend of mine um, who was just in uh, Turkey and read your book in a, in a giant temple as part of her, her trip, um, she said, uh, do you think our current mystical experiences lack depth because they lack conscious knowledge of Platonism? Um, and then she thinks of only charismatic churches as like the few places that encourage similar, if not the same kind of mystical experiences. And like, how can we be participating in these higher realities? Um, yeah. Well, there are a couple of different, you know, ways to answer that. You know, one, and this is in my uh in the book that I mentioned that's going to come out from Oxford next year, uh, one is people have spontaneous experiences. Uh, so that does, you know, that phenomenon has existed and exists now. Uh, and so you, and you have people who have provided their records of that. Uh, sometimes these experiences are um, directly a result of some kind of practice. So, for example, uh, one l very extensive record we have is by a fellow with a PhD in mathematics whose name was Franklin Merrill Wolf, And he lived in California with his wife uh, up in the mountains. And he practiced a form of meditation that's connected to uh, Advaita Vedanta, that tradition. Uh, but he had this breakthrough experience in his books, you know, outline what that was, and then the, con you know, the subsequent uh, experiences he had. And he really was extra traditional to a large extent. Uh, and there are other people like that that I, I discuss in the book. So that's one answer. Uh, you have kind of spontaneous experiences. Uh, then, secondly, 
you have people who are working in particular traditions. So, for instance, uh, Buddhism is, I think, uh, the most uh, sophisticated in terms of giving a map, uh, giving, you know, a kind of uh, itinerary of stages of consciousness, where you're at, what's happening, what, uh, why this is the case. Uh, so Buddhism, particularly in some of the meditation traditions, really outlines in a very clear way uh, where, you know, where you are, where, you know, where you can go uh, in terms of awakening consciousness. So within specific traditions, there are such things. Buddhism is noteworthy for being so developed and so devoted to specifically this set of questions. And of course here, when we're using a term like mysticism, uh, I'm not sure that mo that Buddhism can really be described as mysticism the way most people think of it, because most people think of mysticism either as fuzzy-minded, you know, sort of um, um, incoherence or as um, devotionalism, so it's some sort of emotionally being carried away. And if people think of mysticism in those kind of terms, then of course it has nothing to do with Buddhism, really. On the other hand, the book Platonic Mysticism points out that there are other ways of, there are other traditions in Western European tradition, uh, in, within which I would also include um, American and British um, traditions and it in that case here what we're talking about is what I'm calling platonic mysticism and that is relatively close to Buddhism actually uh, Plotinus is really relatively close to Buddhism uh, I'm not saying they're identical but definitely in especially middle and late Platonism uh, and then Platonism as it goes into the Christian tradition in works like Cloud of Unknowing or um, to some extent the Theosophic tradition that I've written about, uh, then you have something that's really relatively close to Buddhism. And again, I'm not saying they're identical. I think... Um, the term perennialism is often understood as all these things are pointing to the same thing, they're all going in the same direction, all religions are one, and so on. Uh, and those things just aren't true, actually. Uh, they're just stories we tell ourselves sometimes, maybe. Um, but that's really not what perennialism is. And perennial philosophy is a book that redefines what perennialism is in terms of what we're also calling platonic mysticism. And there, if you're looking at ascent of consciousness or transformation of consciousness, then you're looking at something that is analogous to what we see in Buddhism. And we can go in more depth about that, but I think that's probably enough. Yeah, so so how do you, how do you view perennialism? Because I, I like that you talked about kind of this primordial, I don't know, essence for lack of a better word. And you talked about how different groups and different points in history were maybe converging on something similar. And I really appreciate your point of not going, like saying all religions are the same. And that's a really important distinction to avoid this kind of lack of depth almost. I think that people can kind of get a trap into say, oh, it's all the same and we're all, it doesn't matter. and. If there's no distinctions, then, then what are you talking about kind of uh, fallacy? So yeah, how, how do you, how would, so, even like maybe a more relevant question, like how would someone try to practice perennialism or bring it into their life uh, from what you see? 
Well, essentially, the the book Perennial Philosophy is about uh, a platonic understanding of truth and the individual course to realizing truth. That's what Platonism is ultimately about. And that's different. In other words, it's fundamentally different to say that uh, there are things are, that are true, and we can realize them, and that truth, if it is true, is then something that other people can also realize, and that's perennial philosophy, okay? That's different than saying uh, that all religions lead to the same place. Um, those are different, different uh, things entirely. And perennial philosophy is ultimately philosophical. Uh, so it's pointing in a direction, but it's not uh, itself a path. In other words, it's pointing toward a path. Um, so how do you how do you bring that into your own experience in a in a more realized way? There you have to have discipline and some kind of practice, um, and that would be some kind of contemplative practice. In Christianity, there's has a caustic prayer um, within Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, for instance, or Greek, uh, then there is meditation, meditation tradition within Buddhism. So, for instance, there's a tradition called Maha Mudra, which is a meditation tradition in Buddhism, and these are these are paths. Uh, so, there's a difference between pointing toward the path and then the path itself. That's what I would say. Yeah, that's great. And um, my my friend who's been meditating for something like 50 years and had uh, a lot of profound mystical experiences before he read Plato. And then when he read Plato, he essentially like knew he had to be a philosopher. Just like, he goes, oh, this is what I want to do with my life. And he teaches philosophy now. And so he wanted me to ask you some questions too, very related to what that is so, um, he asks, uh, please explain how Plato thought the philosopher could apprehend the forms. That's really not a question that I can answer uh, because uh, it goes, it, it pushes to, uh, answer a discussion of uh to go into a discussion of forms and what that what that means contextually within plato and then uh the question of means within plato plato doesn't offer really a uh path he points toward uh some realizations uh, so I can't answer that in uh, uh, a way that I think would satisfy the questioner. What I can say is that in Platonic mysticism, what I'm tracing is a tradition primarily within Christianity of contemplative practice, which has as its center the transcendence of self and other. And you see this beginning, uh, it comes into the Christian tradition with a Platonic uh, figure, possibly a, a Platonic philosopher, uh, Dionysus the Areopagite, who wrote treatises like Mystical Theology. And Mystical Theology essentially asserts that there is no this, know that, 
Uh, it's very similar to what in Buddhism is called the Prajnaparamita Sutra, which says no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no concept, no seeing, no hearing. It, it's a series of negations, and that's essentially what Dionysus brings into the Christian tradition from Platonism. And it manifests all the way through the Christian tradition. So that then is allied with a method, and the method is prayer. But the word prayer is not petitionary prayer. It's contemplative prayer, which is a form of meditation. And so that's what I focus on in the book. So I, I in the book, do not really go into great depth on Plato's work. What I do is look at Platonic mysticism, which is what the title of the book is. And the reason I don't go into Plato's work is that goes in a whole new... In other words, the whole book would then be on Plato. And what I'm doing is focusing on this current of Platonic mysticism that's been overlooked, and then how that intersects with our society today and what it may portend for the future. So that's that, and that's where the book really ends. So, so that's what I would say. I don't, I don't claim to be an expert in uh, Plato's work, although, of course, I have substantial experience in reading it over many years uh, in translation many different translations, um, but essentially what I focus on in the book is, is this current of Platonic mysticism, and there I can answer the question. Does that make sense? No, definitely, yeah. Like, so I hear you saying you don't want to overshadow the Platonic mysticism element by just broadly talking about Plato, and so that was a part of the, your goal was to talk about the mystical element. Um, is is Socrates a mystic? Like, how do people like Socrates or Jesus even to get on the Christian side of things matter to people that are interested in the Platonic mysticism or mysticism more broadly? Well, I think um, there are different ways. Whether you're looking whether you're talking about Socrates or Jesus. Um, in the case of Socrates, there are different ways to understand Socr the figure of Socrates. And that more broadly can be said about um, major Platonic figures. But with Jesus... Uh, it depends which Jesus you're referring to. So if it is the Jesus whose sayings are in the Gospel of Thomas, the Jesus who said, uh, split a stone and I am there, uh, then that is different than uh, some other Jesus, as one could say. So it just depends. Um, the Jesus that I'm most interested in is the one who says, split a stone and I am there, uh, who provides these uh, aphorisms and uh, parables and insights and revelation and is illumination. So there you're looking actually at Christ. And with Christ, you're that, you know, Christ is a mystery figure, a uh, figure of revelation. Um, and that's what you see in many of the Gnostic scriptures, a revelatory uh, figure bringing light. And that's, that's a Jesus that, or a, a Christ, uh, which is not necessarily the same or identical with uh, 
a belief a belief centered uh, Christ, you could say, or uh, that's that's what I would say about that. And with regard to Socrates, well, Socrates is one of a great uh, line of interlocutors who ask awkward questions. <laughs> Yeah, I loved. Um, yeah, I love. I love learning more about both of those people and their lives and how they've impacted people. Um, and so, like it, when Eckhart talks about Christ or God, is like, is that more what you like or what you think is more personally transformative? Um, and like practice. He and and like yeah. Tell me about Eckhart. Like, what do you, why why did you choose to put Eckhart in your book? And why is he interesting to people that might want to know more about mysticism? Well, Eckhart was uh, the arguably the greatest mis, you know, medieval mystic, and certainly one of the greatest mystics of all time. Very uh, within the Christian tradition, very mysterious figure because he is essentially manifesting this kind of transcendent discussion of transcendence that resonates in many Buddhists, including Japanese uh, Zen Buddhist philosophers, recognized immediately uh, in reading Eckhart that there's that what he is describing and discussing is uh, very resonant with what they see in Zen Buddhism. That there's a real resonance between Zen Buddhism and uh, Eckhart's philosophy, and that's that's fairly well documented and documentable. What differentiates Eckhart is that he doesn't really give you a path to where he is. So he gives you these transcend these expressions of transcendence. He doesn't say, "Okay, first, here's what you need to do." Uh, and so Eckhart is sort of like at the top of the mountain. So you see the top of the mountain, but you're not totally sure like how he got up there. And that's uh, something that I think is characteristic often in uh, Western mysticism more broadly, in Christian mysticism. Now, there are exceptions to that. It's not the case that there are no um, descriptive paths. But, uh, you know, there are... Off, often what you find is, like Eckhart, expressions of transcendence without necessarily the path explicitly given to you to get there. And that's a Christianity that's very different, in any case, from one which is uh, strictly belief-centered. So belief in the vicarious sacrifice of Christ, um, and that that's enough. You don't really, you just need to believe. Um, that is very different than what you see in Eckhart where there's this expression of sheer transcendence and an understanding of the nature of reality, which is very profound. But how do you get to that? And that's that's really the key question. Yeah, I've read a lot of his works, and he does a lot of negating. You talk about like negative theology in, your, in the Platonic Mysticism book, and he does that a lot. Like, I'll sit in a sauna after maybe having read him with a, another Christian, really close Christian friend, and I'll just kind of meditate for 10 minutes and then start almost like internally chanting some of what we read and like the negation of uh, various things. Like, and, and what's beautiful about him even is he, in at least some of the passages I've read, like he'll put symbolic experiences and then he'll throw those out. Um, and he'll even negate these kind of like profound symbolic experiences and say well that's good but actually like god is better or like it's very interesting the way he um manages to almost juggle such things so elegantly 
um, and he'll he'll say, well, there was, you know, I don't want to get too, but but he'll, he'll like say like, well, yeah, there was time in two thousand years ago, but we're in the moment now, like now all all is now and things like that. It's really not just the simplistic kind of like pop spirituality, all is now, but it's this like sermon where that shows up and he's kind of arranging things um, in this kind of bringing them up and then negating. And um, yeah, he's just so profound, he's so beautiful. His, his works um, really turned me on to the Christian strain of this and, and um, going straight to the Greeks, I was almost easier or the Buddhists because the Buddhists have such a rich, rich tradition, but we're Christian philosophy. Like, yeah, maybe we can talk about that. So how, how has Plato influenced modern cultures in the way people just don't appreciate? Uh, I know you and John, when we met briefly, you talked about that a little. Like how important is Plato to the way we see the world? Well, what I would say is Plato and Plato's work represent um, back, you know, they're the backstory. They are behind the scenes, um, a behind the scenes presence uh, at the origins of what we think of now um, uh, as the West and Western philosophy, European philosophical tradition, uh, that's, that's um, often the way people uh, think. Uh, certainly, uh, Plato is important, um, but what I find more important now is the research and development of the study of consciousness. Uh, because I think Plato provides some instructive, you know, and uh, stimulating work. But today, the, the, you know, the question that I think we now are facing is, how do we bring together scientific and other forms of investigation with the study of consciousness. And I think that really is the future. Uh, so Plato has allusions to that kind of thing or elements that you can draw from. But where we are today is a very, it's a very different kind of uh, circumstance with the development of um, different theoretical and other kinds of approaches, I think we today are at the dawn of an era for the study of consciousness. And that's why uh, BLN Wallace developed uh, these, what he calls contemplative observatories, one of which is the first of which is in uh, Colorado, actually up, up, up in the mountains. And the contemplative observatories include these small cabins, these hermitages for people who are in retreat working in the realization of deeper states of consciousness. So that's, that's a, new, a new development for us in America to a large extent. And there, it's a global phenomenon. I think that's extremely important. So that's what I think is the most exciting development that we have right now. How could that, um, or what would a world that embraced that look like? Like how would that change things if, if 50 years of really high quality consciousness research to it, like it's upper potential, like what, what do you think that would change? Well, when we have uh, what we have right now is a, a, a civilization or a, a society globally that's based in uh, exploration of and exploitation of the world around us. That's our, that's our social system. 
you could say. And so uh, to give an example of this, our solutions are all oriented in the same way. Thus, for example, uh, people say, well, we have to get rid of fossil fuel vehicles, so the solution is electric cars, and we need lithium mines for electric cars. So we need these vast lithium mines, and this is all for environmental purposes. And we're all, you know, and it's all externally oriented. Uh, so the problems and the solutions generate new problems, which then generate new, and it's all external. It's all about the uh, exploration and exploitation together of the cosmos around us and of other people. Now, this looking at consciousness is looking inward. That's a different kind of exploration. So what kind of a world would it be if we had many people, even some people, even just a few people, whose primary purpose is the exploration of consciousness and realization of deeper, more profound experiences of consciousness, which include transformative experiences of not aiming at exploitation, but rather care, compassion, kindness. Let's say that's a major theme of consciousness. What would the world look like if you had more people who were realized and who were expressing, uh, as part of that realization, greater kindness, greater compassion, greater wisdom. I think it might be quite positive. Certainly, it's not then contributing to the relentless exploitation of everything, and possibly that exploitation is not totally fulfilling. It's possible the lithium mine might not be fulfilling in the end. That's possible, right? So yeah. we might have a different world. That's possible. Certainly, it would be different for those people who are so engaged. That's what I would say. Yeah, do you know uh, Simone uh, Vale? She says like be similar to like Gandhi, like be the change, be the example. Um, and there's uh, we were in my last Plato Club. We were talking about this uh, Masanobu Fukuoka. Do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's like an example of what you're saying, where he gives up the um, Heideggerian like extractive lifestyle to live more uh, in harmony with the forces of nature, so to speak. And well, Heidegger was quite critical of of uh, exploitive society. Right. No. Yeah. I meant I should have said that better. Right. He was making that criticism very explicitly. That's right. And that's what I mean by Heidegger. Like that, the Heideggerian point of uh, my my friend Daniel says, like turning everything into a standing resource, so everything becomes a thing for including us, including people. To... Right. That's, yeah. That's what Facebook does. Facebook monetizes you. Yeah, no, the algorithms That is, that is what Facebook does. Yeah. And not just for purposes of its own platform, but to every possible extent, tracking you, monetizing you by tracking you. And people don't realize how much they can do that. And people think, oh, well, it's just cookies. Well, it's not, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's rather interesting. You know, uh, the Internet era is actually monetization of everything, um, but monetization of people. Um, when you look at uh, Facebook's new name, Meta, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the term Meta, actually, the term Meta m means transcendence. So metaphysics, transcendence of physics. So essentially, I see what they're doing as creating something new that can be monetized. Um, it's a product. Um, and in some sense, it is, you could say, uh, uh, the opposite of meta. 
it's a kind of uh, surrogate. It's a surrogate for uh, transcendence. And it's not transcendence. It's a, it's a virtual entertainment system. There's a difference between transcendence of con transcendence within consciousness and meta as a virtual reality entertainment system. So there are increasingly complex ways in which technology is serving as a surrogate for or intervening with or a kind of pseudo form of uh, things which really uh, should be a concern for people. I think, I think uh, the movie Matrix, uh, the Matrix series, which devolved uh, uh, film after film into a more and more <laughs> superfluous and horrible series, nonetheless has as its center a kind of uh, truth about technology. It has a truth about technology in it. That's why Matrix became a set of memes the way it did. And those memes have a lot of energy because there's a truth inside them. So that's what I would say about that. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing. I've studied data science and, and the predictive power of algorithms and then selling that data to people to profit off of you and then transforming like the user experience into something that becomes like this, this demonic seduction that causes people to waste their lives in this like mediocre stimulus environment is um, it's kind of shocking, right? And like older traditions, even before technology was the way it is now, would talk about simulacrums and Plotinus, like eschews image to the point of almost like neuroticism and um, uh, now we're the opposite. We think it's so great to have these virtual worlds and these um, um, being marketed to, like you said, we've, we're, we've trapped ourselves almost. Like we've, instead of having a, a real enemy, we've turned ourselves into enemies. And uh, Byun Chul Han, I don't know if you read his work at all, but he's a kind of a philosopher and he talks about how um, like true eros is basically impossible right now in any meaningful way in politics or these or the market because we have this kind of parasitic relationship where we're almost like vampires to each other just extracting um and and bullshitting like the the perniciousness of of the like like what i love about you is just your your honoring of language right like just honoring the truth is kind of a solution to this perpetual bullshitting that we have from these like very powerful organizations. Um, but then if you start to let that slide, say, oh, it's just entertainment, it's just this, it's just that. Oh, it's okay that I lie when I market because it's my job and I'm giving people what they want. Um, then you, you almost like self-hypnotize into a kind of uh, hell rather than have something done to you. Cause it's, it's so interesting that like young people, they want to work at Facebook or Meta or whatever it's called. They want to like, these are the, the kind of the coolest jobs for a lot of people. And like, I've known data science work there that and they're, they're just trying to like optimize for whatever they're optimizing. They don't really care about like the, the good, the true, the beautiful. They're just, you know, into maybe materialist things or, short-sightedness maybe is another way to, to describe it um, well one of these yeah. one of the things that um, became clear um, and a number of people have written about it for example Nicholas Capaldi wrote about it uh, some years ago now in a book called the shallows and there are a number of others who have remarked on this that the technologies, social media technologies in particular, um, and then whatever Facebook is working on now, uh, in terms of virtual reality, I'm sure it will be the same thing on steroids, as it were, uh, is distractive. It's designed to be distractive. It's intended to be uh, uh, distractive 
to distract our, our consciousness by pulling it in particular directions and manipulating it. And that's, uh, you know, a, a fundamental characteristic of, of Instagram, of TikTok, of all of these platforms. So we get lured in. It pulls our attention in that direction and carries us along but for what purpose? And so I think one of the things that the history of mysticism shows us is that it's possible to draw ourselves out of that kind of net and have a different kind of experience, not only of our own consciousness, but an experience within the world, which is rather different but it requires disconnecting from social media, at least at some points, if not completely. Um, at some points, being able to put it aside, not be pulled into it, because there's a fair bit of research, and I'm sure people um, that you know will confirm this, that uh, there's an addictive quality. Uh, there's an addictive quality to technology in general, but specifically to uh, many of the social media platforms. So I think this, the exploration of consciousness requires caution also about these kinds of things, and often we don't reflect on them. So I'm just bringing it up as, a, as an aspect of this. Right. No, like there, there's so much research in, in gamification of organizational goals. And, and when I studied at work psych um, at our biggest conference, you could kind of see an exponential growth in projects related to gamification um, and in the video game literature and the avatar literature and all of those things. And, and on the other end, I started doing a yoga practice um, more seriously a year ago, but I've, I've been practicing it for a really long time and one of the main things that's helped me a lot is concentration practice and just I, I will stare at a dot or I'll stare at some object a shell or something and you'll just notice after five or ten minutes or especially if you do it frequently like after even a few weeks all of a sudden you're like I'm back in the world oh there's a there's a three-dimensional ontologically rich uh, experience happening right here and I also take classes um, or took some classes recently with Tom Cheatham, who studies Henry Corbin and many other people like that on like dance and music and how, you know, there's 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 worlds of, of insects and sounds and things that we almost like reduce away when we put ourselves in this kind of um, what's in it for me, desire seeking and fulfilling framework. And, and if you don't cultivate it, it just, it, it seems very normal to, to go like, okay, well, what do I want now? What is, what is my desire? And you just get kind of sucked in to that, um, that mentality when really like our desires are as simple as they were 3000 years ago or 2000 years ago when, when Plato was writing. And we've, we've almost turned it into a, uh, like a philosophy to just be optimizing on pleasures. Um, and like you said, at the expense of, of the material world, potentially that we're literally standing on and the air we're breathing. Um, do, do you um, see any like concentration practices or um, kind of practices? I love, I love the idea of like orthopraxy versus orthodoxy. And um, are there, practices that people could kind of get into more simply or would you recommend them more just trying to join these traditions that we've been talking about or how can people um you know reverse that that wicked trend of of facebookification um or self-gamification well one of the things that i and a few friends have been working on uh behind the scenes and we are creating at uh, Hyros Institute. Hyros mm. is a nonprofit. It's a 501c3 
that was created a few years ago, and it's devoted, the word hieros means the sacred, uh, revelation of the sacred. That's why we get the term hierophany um, or hierophant. Those kinds of words come from hieros, hiero, Greek word for the sacred, and revelation of the sacred. And we're creating some courses. Uh, one of the courses will be in Christian mysticism, but yeah. Christian mysticism understood as practice. What do you actually do? Uh, so that's, you know, that is coming. Uh, then we're doing a course in sacred gardens um, and how to create a sacred garden. So these are, these are practical courses, essentially. And there's, awesome. there's one also called Becoming Conscious. Um, and becoming conscious is about working with the humanities tradition in terms of consciousness. Uh, and so these are, and it's organized in terms of experiments. So watch the space because this is something for the future. And, and within that context, and specifically in terms of uh, the practice of mysticism, attentional focus is vital that's it's an actual capacity of the mind and it's the foundation for a lot of what makes us productive and creative uh, so that's an important thing to cultivate and i think what you're doing with regard to yoga that's that's absolutely terrific in the tibetan tradition the word for that is shamatha and shamatha means the focusing or the stabilizing of consciousness and that's a that's the foundation of all meditation practice it's the it's the base it's the core it's the essence uh, without which other other uh, elements can't manifest and so that's really it's really vital you're absolutely right about that and it's also coincidentally the exact opposite of what we were talking about in terms of social media. Yeah, yeah. Social media is distractive. It's the opposite of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, and so it's not that, uh, I mean, I uh, visit so, some social media occasionally myself. It's not that you can, you necessarily have to completely, you know, eliminate it. It's that it's important to have a balance in life and cultivating your ability to um, have attention, your attentional capacity is a vital part of being creative, of, of being uh, productive in life. And mm -hmm. it just happens to also be directly related to a deeper understanding of consciousness. So those things are all interconnected. Right. Both concentration allows you to like exert what your will above your petty desire. So if I'm trying to lose weight and always drawn to these bad restaurants that I built the habit of eating at, I need the ability to concentrate on my higher goal to sometimes break through that. But then also, yeah, like in the meditation practice, um, if you only have scattered thoughts, you need to concentrate first to then like kind of transcend the um, discursive realm, so to speak. Um, yeah, that's and, right. Uh, so, so oh, that's excellent. So, um, just to to answer, ask another couple of questions about practicing this, um, uh, my friend talks about anagage and dialectic. Um, so, how what what is anagage? Why is it important to Plato? And then, why is dialectic so important as well? Um, well, one of the things that I think um, uh, is really interesting in what you're what you're alluding to there is uh, the importance of I would say dialogue, you know, uh, not dialectic but dialogue. Uh, two people, two different perspectives, and you go back and forth, and you come to a higher understanding, and you see this. Uh, throughout the Western tradition, and Plato, you know, Plato really inaugurates it, uh, but it's a fundamental uh, 
uh, element, uh, the dialogic going back and forth, and out of that coming to a higher understanding. I think that's that's present. It's carried into this Platonic mystical tradition, and it's uh, continued. So you have dialogues, you have um, dialogic understanding. Even somebody like Eckhart can be understood in terms of a dialogue between him and his reader. Uh, there's a kind of dialogic, or him and his audience, because the, much of what we have is actually sermons. So there's a dialogic, an implied dialog dialogic element, even to somebody like Eckhart. But in a lot of cases, they're actually in the West dialogues, and they all they all echo Plato. And I think that, that there's something very important there in terms of exchange of understanding moving toward a higher a higher set of realizations so that's and that's also true by the way in buddhism you have these um dialogue dialogues uh these questions and answers um you know the master and the student uh this this happens uh this kind of exchange happens in um uh, in um, Buddhism as well. So I, th I think it's not limited only to the West. It's a, no, I've it's never a fundamental uh, way of being that I think is, is a vital part of uh, coming to a deeper understanding. And um, I see that we're, you know, about an hour and a little bit longer. Are there, are there some things that, is there something that you would see as uh uh, important as we draw this uh, to a close? Yeah, we can definitely um, wrap up. Let me just scroll through. Um, yeah, my, my friend asked, like, another friend, how how do we better, like, let the logos into our life and follow the logos? It's like a very platonic kind of esoteric idea. And uh, And this person has been meditating for 30 or 40 years, has been part of Buddhist Sangha's, um, very practiced and still like wonders how better to do that. Well, the word logos, um, what, what I would say is when you look at the American trans, in American transcendentalism, uh, there was an impulse and the the term transcendentalism actually was applied to the to the folks they didn't create it themselves they didn't say hey we're transcendentalists it's that you know their critics called them that and the term kind of stuck but really it's this group of friends and the group of friends were mutually supporting uh so f they included bronson alcott and ralph waldo emerson and henry thoreau and and uh, uh, later others, uh, there, there were uh, a number of them, and the group kind of varied. Um, but what did they have in common? They had in common the, they all did read Platonism. They all were, you know, versed in that. A number of them actually read Greek. Um, but more than that, they concluded that the most important thing was their intuitive capacity, that, that we as human beings have an intuitive awareness that as we cultivate it, it and we listen to it, it won't steer us wrong. There's a, there's a fundamental awareness that we have which is unsullied and pure and that awareness we can awaken we can um, realize and that's a important part of american transcendentalism and i think there's a, a something real there for us to heed uh, so i would say listen to what you're called to do you know, that's what we started talking about at the beginning is, you know, that's 
basically what I've done with all of my books. I, I feel called to write it. Um, I'm not positioning it for some reason. I'm not calculating or trying to create something for some ulterior motive or, you know, it's, it's not about that. It's, this is what I feel called to do. I'm pulled in this direction. I know on some fundamental level it needs to be done. And that if I don't do it, it won't, it won't happen. Now, this is in terms of things in the world, things that, that we're called to do. That is one thing I can say. Then there's the other, which is the realization of that fundamental or primordial awareness that we have. And that's something that we need to focus on in a disciplined way and just continue. And so those are the two things that I would, you know, I would say. There are two different aspects to that. One has to do with expression, the first, and the second has to do with consciousness. So that's that's how I would answer that. And I'm not sure whether it does, uh, because uh, I, I'm not sure what one means by logos. Uh, that varies. But here, that's what I would say. So, you know, how's that for a place to draw this to conclusion? Yeah, this is great. W would you be interested in doing this again or doing this with like John Verveke or one of my friends that's a professor that that's deep into this and maybe having uh, extending this and talking more about the practices and the history and those things. Yeah, we can do that. That'd be, that'd be fine. Sure. Great. I, I, have do that. I love your writing. I could praise you all day and, you know, go stop short of maybe building an altar in Michigan somewhere, but it's just, it's so fantastic that you write with such clarity and I, you, you can just tell you love the truth and, and you're always so scholarly about some things that can get very passionate or very um, uh, get mystified, too mystified in, in the language. Uh, your, your demystification of mysticism is excellent. And uh, yeah, just thank you so much, Arthur. I really appreciate you making the time today. Yeah, I, I appreciate the conversation. It's a, it's a good conversation and I, I appreciate your kind remarks. You know, I'm, uh, I'd be happy to continue the conversation if you'd like to have one with uh, John or whomever. That's that's great. And uh, biggest issue is is scheduling, but we can work that out. So yeah, no, so, for yeah. sure. And I'm super flexible. I love this. This has really changed my life. Just um, pursuing kind of this this path rather than money or status or or prestige and, and those things. And, and uh, I'm constantly curious about, you know, the whole thing. So I'll read well, a few keep more. Keep exploring. It's, yeah, all yes. about, it's all about exploration. And uh, there's much more to be said about that. So so let's continue the conversation. In the meantime, thank, thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your afternoon and everything. You too. Take Talk care. to you later.